Today, I'm going to be talking about the Battle of the Sexes tennis match that took place on September 20th, 1973 at the Houston Astrodome between tennis legends Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs. It's one of the most fiercely debated matches in tennis history. It's one of the most important matches in tennis history. And I'm going to be giving you all the details, all the rumors, all the conspiracies right now. The Battle of the Sexes is a title that has been used to refer to a number of different tennis matches between men and women, but when most people mention it by name, they're usually referring to the match that took place on September 20th, 1973 between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs. It was a heavily publicized event following an original match between Riggs and then number one women's tennis player Margaret Court, whom Riggs beat so badly that the game was referred to as the Mother's Day Massacre. Riggs, however, would go on to lose the second match to Billie Jean King. Let's go over some more details. Bobby Riggs was a formerly retired professional tennis player who had garnered a reputation as a show-off. After leaving a successful career in the pro tennis circuit, he frequently flaunted his skills by participating in matches where he would give himself handicaps, such as playing while holding an umbrella, running around seats and park benches, and sitting in a rocking chair and more often than not, he would win. Riggs talked a big game and often used his platform to disparage the work of professional women players. Personally, I wish the women would stay in the home and do the kitchen work and uh, take care of the babies and compete in areas where they can't compete in. Though some people claim this was all an act, his comments certainly didn't help the reputation of women's tennis, and many women spoke out to counter his chauvinism. Few were as outspoken as Billie Jean King, who was one of the top women's tennis players in the world in 1973. King was a decorated tennis champion with nine Grand Slam titles under her belt, and her success and fame allowed her to be a prominent voice in the fight for gender equality in sports. Among other things, she co-created the Virginia Slims, the first all-woman professional tennis tournament, and successfully pushed for equal pay and prizes between men and women pros, which resulted in the U.S. Open becoming the first major tournament to offer equal prizes. So to me, it makes sense why Riggs would want to challenge King in the first place. He's coming off the high of beating the number one women's tennis player in the world, which only fueled his chauvinistic comments. And now he gets a chance to play against a woman who is probably the most staunch advocate for equal rights between men and women players. So to be able to drive that point home, generate more publicity, more promotion, more hype, makes a lot of sense to me. King's victory was symbolic, not only for her, but for the whole of women's tennis. After seeing Margaret Court lose in the first match, she felt it necessary to win the second and said, quote, I thought it would set us back 50 years if I didn't win, end quote. However, this victory did not come without its share of detractors, and to this day, there remain two camps as to how Bobby Riggs would so unceremoniously lose to King that day. Let's go over them. The first theory is that King beat Riggs fair and square. As mentioned before, King was no slouch in the tennis game. She had already been playing professionally for 14 years, and by the time of the match had nine Grand Slam titles, including four singles wins at Wimbledon. King was also 26 years younger than the 55-year-old Riggs, who, despite his past victory against Court, wasn't in the same shape as his prime in the pro tennis circuit. It is also well known that Riggs didn't spend nearly as much time training, or any time for that matter, for the second competition. He instead spent the four months leading up to the match hyping it, as well as partying. During the match, he played noticeably poorer than usual, with a much higher than average number of unforced errors. King recognized Riggs' cockiness, and instead of playing in her usual aggressive style, turned the game on its head by staying towards the baseline and wearing Riggs out by making him run around more than usual. This is the official outcome of the match, and the story that King maintains to this day, and that Riggs maintained until his death. King, who was no more than 80 feet from Riggs at any given time during the match, said in an interview with ESPN that, quote, Bobby Riggs wanted to win that match. I saw it in his eyes. I saw it when we changed ends, and there is no question. I have played matches where players have tanked, and I know what it feels like and I know what it looks like, and he did not. He was just feeling the pressure. It should be noted that Riggs also accepted his loss to King, saying after the match was over, quote, I know I said a lot of things she made me eat tonight. I guess I'm the biggest bum of all time now, but I have to take it, end quote. His disappointment was corroborated by his friends and by his son Larry Riggs, who claimed that, while sitting in an ice bath after the match, his father said to him that this was the worst thing he had ever done. It's clear to me, based on the fact that Riggs later said he underestimated Billie Jean's skills, and combined with the fact that he spent no time training for this match, 
that him just losing because he was sucking it up that day is very plausible. And I think that even with the deeper digging into some of these conspiracies, this is the one that makes the most sense to me. The second and most famous theory is that Riggs threw the match. Many people were quick to call out Riggs' poor gameplay, recognizing the unforced errors and the fact that he didn't play with his usual speed. Donald Dell, a former captain for the Davis Cup, described that Riggs looked like he was playing in slow motion, and that, quote, it was as if he had taken a sleeping pill, end quote. In addition to being a hustler, Riggs was also a famous gambler and was known to bet on just about any game he could. It has been rumored that over the years, he amassed an enormous gambling debt and by throwing the match, he would able to bet against himself and win enough money to pay back those he owed it to. Although this theory was tossed around in the years following the match, it rose back to prominence in 2013 when a man named Hal Shaw came forward 40 years later to reveal the details of a conversation he overheard while working a late night in the pro shop, Shaw heard voices coming into the building. Thinking it was robbers, he shut off his light and hid. However, he quickly recognized the voices as mobsters from the Florida and New Orleans mobs, speaking very suspiciously about Riggs and talking about how he would play matches against the two greatest women tennis players at the world. After an hour of deliberation, the four men stood up and left. While this is an intriguing story, its plausibility remains to be seen. Many of Riggs' contemporaries and family, who knew of his connections to the Chicago and Florida mobs, have called the claims into question, such as why the mobs would be involved with tennis gambling in the first place. Nobody has denied these claims more than Riggs himself, who maintained from the day of the match till the last day of his life that he did not throw it, saying that he, quote, made the classic mistake of overestimating myself and underestimating Billie Jean King, unquote, regretting spending so little time training for the match. Unfortunately, Riggs passed away on October 25, 1995, after a long battle with prostate cancer. King, to this day, is adamant that Riggs' loss was legitimate. But it's still very hotly debated. And I think whether or not Riggs threw the match at this point is kind of irrelevant just because of how important this game was to women's sports as a whole. Women athletes started to be taken a lot more seriously after this. And even to this day, we're seeing a lot of women professional players in any sport be taken a lot more seriously as a result. Whether or not you believe the rumors of the conspiracies to be true or false, it's up to you. Leave your thoughts in the comments and thanks for watching.